for me, I'll, I'll kind of do a slow intro here for anyone who's uh, just getting in. Um, but thank you all for spending the end of your Friday with us. Um, there's one more thing, I think, after this uh, uh, DEI conversation happening in Discord, but this is the last uh, panel of the day. And uh, we're going to spend the next hour talking about this idea of sunsetting games, this idea of uh, games, the interest in games changes much, much quicker than other things in education. Uh, and would love to talk to my awesome colleagues who are in uh, middle school, high school, and collegiate with me um, about what they're thinking about, their challenges, and all that stuff. So uh, you may know me. I'm the director of the esports program at UCI. I've helped co-chair this conference for our four years. Um, and I'm going to ask my, my panelists here to uh, introduce themselves and give you a brief history of their program. So we're going to start with... Uh, the gentleman serving the youngest population will go up from there. So uh, Chris, please introduce yourself. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Chris Aviles. I am a middle school STEM teacher uh, working with fourth through eighth graders in the Monmouth Beach School District here in New Jersey. Uh, I started one of the first, if not the first, middle school esports team in, uh, in the country uh, about four years ago. Uh, and since then, I've been on a pretty fun journey. Uh, when I started my middle school esports team, we didn't really have anybody to play. So I reached out to some local colleges here in Jersey, like Rutgers and Stockton, we played them. Um, and we got a lot of really cool national press around, you know, these middle schoolers playing these college kids. And then everybody kind of started emailing me, hey, you know, we're in middle school, we'd love to play. We're in middle school, we'd love to play. Um, so I started a league. And uh, year one, I had about 40 middle schools from around the country that we just kind of like met up and played. And year two was going really well. We grew to about 60, you know, middle schools and then COVID hit. And, you know, we, we lost quite a few, even though some of us were able to keep our seasons going. Um, I also had some free time during COVID. And so I decided to uh, start a nonprofit called Garden State Esports because I was blown away by the stories my kids were telling me you know, both on my own team and, and, you know, from around the country that were part of this league about how esports was helping their mental health and they were feeling depressed, but this is a great way to connect with kids. Um, you know, even though, uh, you know, they weren't in school, they could still, you know, have fun gaming with their friends or making new friends and competing against kids from around the country. Uh, and so, you know, through Garden State Esports uh, for the last two years, we have grown very quickly. Uh, I currently have 130 school districts, which is about a third of the state in my league. Um, so it's kind of neat as, as, you know, when I was a, as I like to say, a recovering high school English teacher, I tried to get esports started at my high school in 2011. Uh, and it wasn't until I left the district and, you know, went to a new one in 2018 that I got the middle school team, uh, middle school, middle school team started. And since then, um, you know, I've been serving, uh, you know, I think we have about 2000 active students in the league. So I'm really excited uh, for this conversation because I was telling the panel, you know, before we let everybody in, I have as many questions as I do thoughts on this because uh, as somebody who serves middle school and, and as a league that does not play any uh, M from, you know, rated games, any mature games, there's only a certain amount of, you know, games that I could draw from. And so we're approaching, um, we're approaching a point where I have more time to fill throughout our season than I have games. And so I've been exploring uh, a lot of different options. And so I'm excited to, you know, hear from everybody and, and learn along with everybody. How do we sunset these games in a way? Because, you know, many of my kids take these games very personally, um, especially, you know, the better they are, the more serious they take them. And so making sure that I'm able to provide not just for my students, but for kids in the state of New Jersey, the opportunity to continue to game, you know, in a, in a genre or a way that they enjoy is really important to me. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, looking forward to hearing your perspective on all this stuff and congrats on uh, all the stuff you're doing in uh, New Jersey. Uh, next up, I'd love to invite my wonderful colleague, Ashley Hodge, to introduce herself and tell you all about, all about the wonderful work uh, she's doing in Georgia. I'll say um, mine is not nearly as impressive as Chris. Chris's experience. Um, so yes, my name is Ashley Hodge and I represent uh, high school esports in Georgia. Um, I've run two successful programs. The first one was at Colquitt County. It was the largest program in the state of Georgia. We had, I think about 300 kids when I left 
and now I'm running my second program at a much smaller school, Dodge County. But that program has grown from like five players to about 45 in a year. Even with COVID going on, that's pretty impressive for a student body as small as ours. Um, currently, I serve on the Georgia Student, I don't GHSA, Georgia Student Athletic Association Esports Advisory Board. I serve on the Riot Scholastic America Board. And um, I, just, I just help get esports programs started in Georgia. I, I work as a play versus super coach. So other coaches reach, reach out to me and I help kind of jump their program up. Wonderful. Very impressive regardless. And uh, Ashley's getting her PhD in high school esports. So uh, uh, you'll be teaching us uh, this session and for many years to come. <laughs> uh, lastly, I'd love uh, AJ, go ahead and introduce yourself. How's it going, everybody? My name is AJ Dimmick. I am the director of esports uh, for the University of Utah's varsity esports program. We are just started our fifth season scholarshiping over 30 students in four different games, which is why this is a very compelling topic for me as interests of what students uh, want to play and, and what publishers are interested in, in fostering as a collegiate uh, as a mainstream collegiate esport changes over time. Um, we house esports in an academic unit at the University of Utah as part of the Entertainment Arts and Engineering Program, which is a game development program with uh, now over 600 undergrads and 140 grad students. Uh, and so we, uh, we have a lot of interest in, on games on a lot of different fronts at the U and, and this is a big one. And, uh, and a large student community with uh, interests and competitive teams between the club uh, communities and the varsity of there are 13 uh, games and teams that that uh, that exist here and four of them are varsity um, and uh, how we how we spend money on on which ones we do and which ones we don't is a is a very is a very interesting and evolving uh, evolving idea. Well, appreciate all those introductions. Um, so we're going to kind of guide us through, uh, I guess, a kind of discussion on why, why we pick the games we do, how we think, or what, what, what factors we consider when, when thinking about game titles. Uh, I know choosing game titles is a very popular question. People are always curious about how you do it, why you do it, uh, all those things. Um, so uh, let's go in the same order here. I, I can start us off here, but I'd love for everyone to kind of share what games you currently support uh, at, a, at your kind of highest level here um, and some of the factors you use when selecting those games. So uh, at UCI uh, this year, uh, and for most of our time, uh, we have done League of Legends and Overwatch, so two uh, varsity programs in those two games. Um, I think uh, largely it's based on student interest, uh, and I would say just relevance in the kind of larger esports world. Uh, we love and need to see well-run leagues that are collegiate. Uh, I want to play against colleges. Um, it's no fun playing against people who are below you, above you, or have no sort of kind of relevance to the collegiate experience. Um, and so those are some of the factors that we have looked into um, over the years. So I'll, I guess I'll leave it there and then we'll go to Ashley. How do you pick uh, which games that you've been invested in? All right, so um, in, in high school, especially in Georgia, we're a little bit unique. Um, so the governing body, GHSA, actually has a contract with a company called Play Versus. Um, so you're really not allowed to work with any other company that offers esports right now. Um, there are two more, the High School Esports League and the it's N-A-F-H-S-A. I can't think of what that stands for. But since we're not allowed to participate with any of their stuff, it doesn't really matter. So GHSA kind of dictates what games we play. I really don't get to pick, which is problematic within itself. Um, the current titles that we can play are League of Legends, Rocket League, Smite. They recently added Super, Super Smash, uh, Smash Ultimate, uh, Splatoon 2, FIFA, and Madden. And those are on PCs, the Nintendo Switches, and PS4s, which again is problematic if you're a poor county that can't support consoles. So we're actually very restricted with what we can play. We can't play anything over T for team. Um, most students want to play first-person shooters. 
such as Overwatch and Fortnite, and currently we're not allowed to offer those titles despite the student interest. Um, if I did have the freedom to choose games, I would pick what was most popular and what was supported in the collegiate level because I feel that high school students sometimes are at a disadvantage because they can't properly practice or train for those top tier collegiate programs. Like my students will not be recruited for a Call of Duty collegiate team because we cannot play it, which is a huge issue, which kind of plays into uh, the misconception that violent video games cause violent behavior. Um, you know, as well as I do, there's no proven research that can correlate the two of those. And unfortunately, it's still just very pervasive at the high school level. So even now in 2021, when we've had esports since 2017, it's still a problem trying to um, get people to recognize the importance of esports and the, the mental, emotional, and physical benefits that they do bring children involved in these programs. And I, I've researched all of this for my dissertation. So if you want to know about the research, I can, I can give it to you. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, before the call, Ashley was just telling us about her lit review. So uh, if you need facts, uh, hit up hit up Ashley. Um, I realized I said we were going in the same order and then I, I totally ignored that. So <laughs> let's go to Chris next. Uh, Chris, you're middle school. You've already yeah. shared like your plan, Rocket League, but you got appetite yeah. for more. So tell yeah. us about the games you're playing and your thought process. Yeah. I mean, um, it's interesting because again, not only do I have my own team in my own district to worry about, but I also have to worry about what we're putting out on a state level, right? Um, and so it's interesting. Uh, I, I believe, and, and, and I guess it's a personal belief that M for mature rated games, Call of Duty, uh, uh, CSGO, stuff like that, doesn't have a place in uh, middle school, high school, scholastic esports, K-12. And, and that is a value that's reflected in Garden State Esports. That's a value that's reflected, you know, obviously in my own teams. Um, but that also then limits, again, like Ashley was saying, what my high school kids are prepared for when they leave Garden State Esports, right? So similarly, I can't imagine many of them would be getting any type of scholarship, you know, from AJ's program because we don't, you know, we don't play them. We don't practice them. We don't connect them with colleges, you know, around those titles. Um, but on the other hand, right, we, we copy uh, the New Jersey athletic calendar, right? I've coached, you know, football, wrestling, and track here in New Jersey for 15 years. And so I made sure that our esports calendar, you know, starts and stops and follows what folks are used to in New Jersey. And so, you know, currently right now we have Fortnite, Rocket League, Smite, Overwatch, Knockout City is a new addition, which I'm super excited about. Uh, League of Legends, Super Smash, Valorant. We have competitive Minecraft. And then, you know, it took me three or four years to figure this out, Mark. And that's the fact that chess is an esport. And I added chess last year. And it was such a, like, I was so mad at myself that it took me that long to figure out that we can play chess online. Because I have brought in a whole demographic in so many school districts that maybe aren't ready to play the games. But when you say, hey, we're going to play some chess, super excited. So those are the games that we're offering. Um, but again, you know, kind of looking at the big picture, at least statewide. And, you know, I run around with a lot of uh, other nonprofit organizations run by teachers. You know, there's about 16 of us. And by and far, one of the biggest issues we're having is that the MOBA is not popular anymore. And so... Um, you know, as much as I wish kids would get into Smite, because not only is it a cool game, uh, but the uh, developers have been absolutely fantastic to work with. I cannot, I cannot muster a Smite league, right? And, and you know, Ashley mentioned play versus, and you know, uh, I have some students interested in League of Legends, um, but there are similar to what's going on in Georgia. There's a lot of rules around who's allowed to play League of Legends. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, you know, Riot has made it very hard on themselves uh, to be able to empower educators to bring league to kids, right? So, uh, you know, there's, there's some limitations um, that we have to worry about from developers. There's limitations around the, 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 the ESRB rating or the level of the game that we're playing. And, and so what I've 
tried to explore is, you know, I've polled my kids. Again, I, I've pushed out a survey uh, to, to 130 school districts and the, the information that, that I'm getting back is that once you get, you know, at least here in Jersey, Rocket League and Valorant are the two most popular games. Overwatch is right after that, but kids are very concerned about the move to Overwatch 2. I have some kids that are very upset about losing their tank roles and going from six players to five. Um, but then after that, it's kind of open to what kids want to play. There's no... Um, you know, there, there's no agreement on the next best games, right? So I'm super excited about Knockout City because it's an E for everybody game that I can offer middle schools and elementary schools that are interested. The developers have been fantastic to work with and, you know, they've uh, uh, hooked Garden CD Sports up with, you know, keys and anything else we need to make sure that there's no equity issues around getting the game into their schools. Um, you know, I, uh, when I was offering uh, and, and picking titles, I was very much, anti-console and I, I very quickly kind of learned the error of my ways people educated me a little bit about the console world uh you know because as part you know long story short I've been on PC since I was like four or five years old right my dad left the military he built computers uh for a living afterwards and, and I started to do that with him as a way that we bonded and so I you know I wasn't familiar at all with Smash and to me again when we talk about game choice Smash brings the most diverse crowd to your esports program. And then when we get into cross play and stuff like that, part of what we pushed out through Garmin State Esports is the fact that for, you know, 300 and, and some odd dollars, you can bring uh, a switch program to your school. And, and again, arranging the games, I've arranged the games so that schools can use a switch to be involved with us all year round. Right. So you got the titles, you got, you got the types of games. Um, and it's really been quite the journey to figure out, you know, how do I fill those last two or three seasons or those, those last two or three slots with something that's going to engage students. And, you know, I'll save my ideas, you know, later because I would love to get Ashley and AJ and Mark your opinion uh, on what I'm thinking, but it's, it's super, it's super surprising. If you had asked me a couple of years ago, how meaningful the games that you choose wind up being um because it, it makes all the difference from who comes out to your squad to uh you know what you're allowed to play the college opportunities around the different games so it's been it's been a journey uh around choosing titles that i'm i'm, I'm excited to continue to explore awesome well thank you for sharing all that so aj same question to you what games you plan and uh yeah, how'd you pick those? yeah I, I i uh i might frame this in starkly different terms than, than Ashley and Chris, Chris do. Um, in 2016, when, when a very vibrant and thriving student organization uh, was knocking down the door of, of, of the university and, and uh, the academic unit trying to, trying to do what some schools had done, um, uh, and there were just a few uh, back, back then, of, of get, uh, associate scholarships and the university brand to gaming teams and when we were forming it it, it was uh it, it had to do a couple of things it, it it had to be in the long term it had to be had to be a self-sustaining model because we were going to allocate resources to it we're gonna you know you're gonna spend some money on it and so it it, it no one's trying to make any money off of it we're you'd certainly like to lose as little as possible and and for those things secondly the things that you would do have to be of interest to the student community and it has to serve that community. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, then there's no reason to do it. And so the, the way that we came about it for the long esports in the long term and existing as part of the collegiate experience at the University of Utah was we weren't going to elevate a single game and have a League of Legends team. And that was just the gaming team at the University of Utah. We wanted to have a diverse set of games and we wanted to have a, a, uh, multiple games one because when they change and there's a lot of them that's less of an interruption of the total thing uh of, of how you function but also those multiple games was an invitation to all of the gamer community and, and hopefully trying to say that no matter what you're interested in and no matter what you what uh relate what you relate to as, as a gamer that there's something here that we we want to serve all of you and we want to be one gaming community and not three or four or five divergent ones that function in different spaces on the campus uh and 
taking a lot of our cues from the student gaming community at that time, decided that we wanted to have many, we wanted to have four. And so as we, I mean, at that time in 2016, there were 13 competitive teams functioning at the University of Utah uh, from that student community uh, that were doing it. And so if, if you're gonna, based on a resource restriction, what are you elevating to varsity and why? Um, and based on that, we established a criteria that one, that it had to be a, a title of community interest here. So if it's the biggest thing in the world, but not of interest to our community, then why would we care? Um, two, there had to be, it had to be a game with the collegiate ecosystem uh, that was prevalent out there. So if you had a team, does that team have anyone to play against and does it have a championship uh, uh, ecosystem to participate in? And as I've grown, you know, in year five of this, I define that differently now than I did in year one. And I don't care if a lot of the third party organizations are running tournaments for a thing. If the publisher isn't interested in functioning in it to make it, isn't interested in it being a collegiate, a collegiate esport, then neither am I. Um, and the third back then, which is a radically different conversation now than it was back then is the propriety of the content of, and it, part of it was survival when you were, when we were introducing that we were institutionally supporting esports and gaming on campus and allocating resources to it, um, it was like, how many different wars and how many different fronts do you want to fight? Um, and so having a, a I, I remember, I'll tell the story out loud now that we had a CSGO team uh, in the press release for, for Utah esports probably up until 10 days before we announced the varsity sports program, because it was, it was two of those things. They did have quite a vibrant collegiate ecosystem. And it, after League of Legends, it may have been the second most uh, vibrant community in our campus in 2016. Um, and so we, eventually somebody noticed and we, and, and was very concerned about the first person shooterness of that game. And we substituted Overwatch for it, which was another one, another very vibrant community for it. And so we, we launched Collegiate Esports at the University of Utah SCAR, shipping 34 kids on a League of Legends team, a Overwatch team, a Hearthstone team, which I could have filled a room full of 300 students anytime I wanted to in 2016 for Hearthstone, and a Rocket League team. Um, and uh, when we did that, we're coming around to a, almost a full cycle where almost there are, that generation of student that there was here in the 2016, 2017 school year are all but entirely gone and it's an entirely new group of students and some of those games don't have the same kind of type of relevance that they had to the campus before and some of the publishers that house the the collegiate tournaments for those games aren't uh as interested in it being a varsity esport in the collegiate ecosystem as they were back then and it's hard to it's hard to spend money on things if the if the publisher itself doesn't want you to spend money on their game. Um, and so it's, it's figuring it out of, of five years later, which boxes that you checked off before are unchecked off now and which games fill those boxes now. And if they do, how do you, how do you transition those things in a way that does justice to the community, does justice to players that have busted their butts for you, uh, that have represented the university well for you, and how do you take money away from one group of kids and give it to another in a good way that everyone or as many people are possible are happy with and is the right thing to do? Love that, appreciate all that context, AJ. Um, so I'm going to get to kind of the meat of the conversation here uh, and, and lay a little bit more groundwork or context. So, so at UCI, uh, when we just celebrated our five-year anniversary, so we're about the same age as AJ here, um, we are uh, recruiting right now uh, applications for UCI fall 2022 open in November. That means I am recruiting athletes right now who will start in fall 2022 and then leave four or five years later. So in 2026, 2027, or maybe 2025, 2026. Anyways, we're talking five-year kind of commitment to athletes. And that's kind of the challenge I have is like, I have not made decisions intentionally about what's happening five years down the road. And I'm really nervous to, to do this right. Um, because I think at the college level, we, we do have a little bit longer commitment. And with the recruiting process and expectation of scholarships, it may be a little bit trickier. But 
Um, I'd like to just kind of go through the group here. Um, we'll start with AJ this time and just kind of AJ lay out some of the inertial barriers. So when you think I'm at, let's, let's say tomorrow you decide to switch games, you're going to pull the plug of one of your vibrant communities and elevate something else. Um, you don't have extra budget. You have to make a shift. Yeah. Like, tell me about some of the barriers that you're worried about uh, when, when you talk about going away from one, pulling the plug and going to something else. It's one of the things that when you start out, you don't foresee happening and it, it, it's hard to imagine. And so like we're, we're, I mean, as the title of this, we're here now talking about it, it's things that we're having to come up on the fly of, of if you recruit students to come to your school to play a game and to get money for playing those games, what is, how do you, I mean, the game is the easy part. You pull it and give it to another thing. How do you pull money from that kid? And the, the, those groups of kids in such a way that that isn't injurious to him and is respectful to him and respectful for like what a lot of them have done for our brand and have represented us and, and done such good things and are really good students. And, and it's interesting, why, why are you punishing a kid for a lot of the things that has nothing to do with anything that he's done? Um, and so, and sometimes you have to because for instance, there's sometimes like games that were that you can be really good at. And if you had an open tryout, you would have the really good kids that are on the team, but you wouldn't really have much more on the entire campus want to be on that team, really. And so so it's it's very local interest. And so I, I think one of the things is, is you, there needs to be notice and buffer of, of, of you can't say we're pulling this game and it's done tomorrow and, and you're on the thing. There needs to be substantial notice to that player so that you aren't taking away resources from him without him having a long time to figure out, figure out what the alternative is going to be. And, and, and some of the things we're thinking about, if I was going to pull a game, I'm the only things that I can arrive at that are ethical is telling a kid, we, there's a year from now, we won't, we will stop supporting this game and do these types of things. And you're not going to lose a thing for a long time. And we're going to continue to support these things. Now, now some of it doesn't have to do with us. I mean, it was into September and we were all worried if there was going to be an overwatch league this year and a, and a hearthstone thing in collegiate without any communication whatsoever about what was happening with that. And so some of that is you, you feel like from the publisher, it's being imposed upon you that you're transitioning uh, from one game to another. And so, so there are other considerations whatsoever of if there's less interest in a game and it feels like there's less interest from the publisher, to fostering a collegiate community on it, you have to you have to be knocking on their door constantly to figure out what their plans are with it as well. Those are all great points. Uh, Mark, yeah, can I, I, I jump in and ask some questions? Please, because please. you yeah. and AJ are talking about something where, you know, again, desperately I'm trying to figure things out. As somebody who's trying to position the students in New Jersey to best take advantage of the post-secondary opportunities that esports provides, I would love your thoughts. Um, and, and especially AJ, I know, I, I believe you said you had 30 uh, scholarship athletes. 34. 34. When you are giving those scholarships, um, are they game-based? Are they, uh, you know, uh, are they uh, similar to colleges like Boise that are giving for, uh, maybe something like production or journalism? So, well, I, I'd, I'd like to separate the, the, those two things a, a little bit. A little bit. Yes. So as far as a competitive team and as far copying and pasting an athletics model over to it is really close of if you check off the box of you're a really good citizen, you are a really good student, uh, you are a, a functional and all those things you check off those boxes. And after those boxes are clear, we want to field the very best team that we possibly can. Now, everyone, everyone and their mother will have an opinion on who the best players are. And then there's a coaching staff to make those determinations about who is, who is a varsity team. And there's lots of close calls sometimes. And, and lots of arguments can be made that after the fact that you got it wrong, but it's always a projection of, 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 uh, uh, who are the best collegiate students, uh, su successful collegiate students that we can have. And if you're a kid looking for a college, we want to recruit you to convince you that I, I find that esports directors aren't usually so far gone that 
when we recruit students, we usually end up recruiting them to like 10 different schools based on what their interests are of, of trying to get them in the ecosystem and, and trying to find the best place for them. But we want to offer those really good players that, that we might be one of those best things and they should explore that. And, but, but it's the best players. Apart from that, yes. And at UCI, they, they do very similar things of there is scholarship for a production team to generate the content and do those things and student managers and, and assistant coaches and analysts if they wanna, if you find students that are willing to put that kind of work in uh, for things. And so absolutely, it, it's more, there's more things available than just players. Okay, so 100% agree, I'm on board with it, but l- let me take that to the next level, AJ. You are giving scholarships for the most talented players at a certain game. Yes. Okay. So here's the question I have as a, as, a, as a middle school educator, former high school educator, maybe Ashley wants to back me up as somebody who works with high school. Um, one, of the, one of the Garden State Esports partners is Evil Geniuses. And they have been very uh, gracious in allowing me to ask them a lot of ridiculous questions because I'm trying to suss out the scene the best I can for my kids. Has there ever been a consideration or AJ or Mark, at least your opinion, um, as two of the collegiate programs that I respect the most, has there ever been consideration for giving scholarships not based necessarily on the game, but the role that the kids play in the genre, right? So I had talked to EG and I said, what do you look for when you were trying to find, you know, the next best player at this game? And they had told me that, you know, uh, if you're playing Overwatch and you're a support player, like you need to be the best Lucio in the world, but you also need to be a talented Mercy. And basically the, the, the conversation wound up being that you should be good at all of the support roles. So knowing that different games across similar genres have those roles, is sunsetting some of these games, could we lessen the blow by saying, hey, if you are talented at first person shooters, you're talented at, you know, mid lading in a MOBA, whether it's League or whether it's Smite, um, we have a place for you. Ha- has any of that ever been considered? Or if not, or, or, or at least you have an opinion on that, can we get kids to Utah? Can we get kids to UCI? Not because they're the best Lucio player in the world, but they have a general, uh, they have a general understanding or ability to play the support role that you may find in, in some of the games similar to Overwatch, for instance. Well, I'll, I'll take I'll a first shot. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I would say largely, I mean, we're recruiting students uh, in their junior, senior year of high school, almost always seniors for me, uh, and sometimes even out of the semi-pro or professional scene. Um, so at that point, like they've kind of specialized in a game. Um, and so I'm certainly looking at the specific game. When I think of a support for Overwatch, uh, I, I certainly would not recruit a one trick player who's only good at one thing. You have to deeply understand the role. If you're a main tank, you have to play all of them because the meta will shift, uh, especially in league when there's bans. I mean, uh, we don't even let one trick players try out for our teams. Um, they might be challenger and we're like, sorry, that will get banned every time. And I don't think you're good other than that. So that, that's one, one, one way of answering the question. The other way I'll answer it is, I think all of our athletes are elite at many games and they got good very early on by developing skills in middle school and elementary school. And I think they were very good at all the games they played. They may not have been top 100, top 500 until this game that they really bonded with came out uh, and they really starred then. But um, I do think there's a role for you to help identify talented young people that, that can understand the economy of a game, can understand how to break it, how to, how to communicate and work together. So um, I guess that's the way I'll answer your question and uh, hopefully that's a little help. And so I'll, I'll chime in on that. It, it, is, it is too simple of an idea to say that we're, we're, we're looking at like Overwatch players and the players with the seven highest SRs are on the team. Uh, it, it's, it's always a projection of, it's not that it's never that simple of, of you are going to look at a league's players champion pool or, or how, 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 uh, how many positions they can play in overwatch, especially for like backup positions and wanting them to be able to do a, a couple of different things. You're also, it's September now and you're, you're speculating of, 
of uh, this player mechanically is excellent, uh, but strat wise is, is not so good. And so you're, you're projecting about if we invest four months or five months into you, what can you be then? And so it, it's never as simple as it's never as simple as, as the seven best players. And it's also, it's also, we're going to be looking at your transcripts. And if, if it's problematic for me to invest money and six months into you and to, and guessing that I'm not going to have you next semester because uh, uh, you're not performing well in school, then that goes into it as, as well. And so, so it's never simple, but at the end of the day, uh, it, it, it's complex, but we are trying, we're trying to win a national championship and, and put the Bulls best teams out there and be as competitive as we can, even though it's, it's guessing like uh, it's especially in league of we're not, we are not going to field five challenger players. We're going to, we're going to be feeling high diamonds and masters and seeing who we think we could stretch if we invested into them into the grandmasters and get it up there. And so it's guessing on those types of things. That's why I mean of, uh, of after the fact, there'll be a lot of people that disagree with you on uh, that you picked the best players available because you were, you were guessing if you, who you can put work into and what kid will put in enough work in himself to be able to be that best team that you can possibly be. So I'm I'm gonna, push, oh, please, Ashley, please. <laughs> I was going to say, I'd also like to add now, um, I'm not a college recruiter or anything, but I've spoken to a lot of them with my kids, sp specifically my seniors. And one of the major things that I was told that colleges look for is your comms. How are your teams communicating? You might have a garbage team and they might communicate better than your team of challengers because the team of cha challengers are all toxic and they're screaming at each other because they lost a, a match or a tower. So I think communication and comms also goes a long way into the consideration because it's not just about one tricks, it's about who is toxic. Like your best player could be a toxic person and you don't need that kind of person on a team that you want to win. I mean, actually I couldn't agree more because when I do tryouts, and again, for my middle school rocket team, when I do tryouts, the rubric is less based on talent, right? Because I just tell a kid, hey, you know, what's your, what's your ranking over the last couple of seasons? Let me, let me get an idea, right? Because that's going to tell me more than anything I could do on a one day tryout. My rubric is all SEL, teamwork, leadership, communication type of stuff. You know, and, and again, as somebody who's coached varsity football, wrestling, and track, and, and, and has won state championships, stuff like that, my best teams are the ones that worked the best together, right? Because, you know, we're better than the sum of all of our parts, right? When we come together like that. So let me, let me push you a little bit more, AJ. Is there a world where the collegiate space is ever offering scholarships, like Ashley said, around kids who are just fantastic communicators at a certain genre, not a game, but a certain genre of game, a shot caller, something like that. Or is there ever a world where collegiate scholarships are based on your ability to play a certain role in a genre of games, right? Because again, if we're talking about sunsetting titles, right? Many of our programs at the high school level, at the middle school level, we're, we're putting our kids in the best position to take advantage of the post-secondary opportunities. If the opportunities are only in Overwatch, well, then obviously I have to cater to Overwatch. If the opportunities are for shot callers and, you know, support roles, well, now we can, you know, from a variety of games, develop that, that mindset, right? That skill set. You see, is there I, ever a world where the scholarships are based on that? You see, I, I think we're, I think we're asking the wrong questions when we get into this a, a okay. little bit. See, I don't think that we are, we would change the way that we, we're going to feel the best team that we possibly can for the, for the thing. And so if a kid convinces us that he's, he is that, then, then we're going to be all ears and doing it, but we're, we're going to try to win. Um, it, good, good academics. And my team will be a team of an, of, 30 engineers averaging a, around a 3.4 GPA, uh, really good students. Two of my, one of my top 500 in NA Overwatch support is, is a nurse, a second year nursing student. Um, but they're, they're going to do those things. But what I think to get at more, what you're talking about is the nature of the collegiate ecosystem from the way mm -hmm. that it's run with its relationship from the publishers to the schools and doing it. So what I think to get to more of the world that you're talking about, mm -hmm. we need 
uh, college esports to stop being the wild, wild west and now our own and us completely dependent on whatever publishers give us um, in the way they do it. And we need self governance in collegiate esports to dictate some of the terms of how we can best serve students to do some of the things that you want to see happen in the question that you are asking right now. No. Mm. Yes. Yeah. No. I, yeah. Look, I and let me, you know, or just one second, Mark, real quick, you know, again, going back to my traditional sports background, as somebody who has coached for going on 15 years, I've seen thousands of kids. I have six kids over those thousands of kids who now play professional sports on the Reds, on the Boston Red Sox for the Dallas Cowboys. Right. I've seen the collegiate coaches come and scout them. I've watched them sat in the meetings where they promised them everything that they're going to get as a D1 athlete. I've watched them go through the combine. Right. I, I couldn't agree with you more is that is one of the most murky, muddy, gray areas that is frustrating, at least for me, Ashley. I don't know if you feel the same way. I don't know the best way to position my kids because there is no standard. Right. We know that it, it, at least when it comes to the, the collegiate space and, and traditional sports, nobody's allowed to talk to my kids. Right. Until they're juniors. Right. You can't go and you recruit a sophomore and stuff like that. So uh, AJ or, or, you know, whoever this video makes its way out to. Right. We're doing our kids a disservice by not having this outlined for them because they, you know, usually have parents. They usually have coaches, um, you know, that 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 aren't at that level that, you know, like an AJ and then a Mark are at the collegiate level. You know, we had a kid um, in New Jersey who was getting uh, recruited for League of Legends. I believe it's called like the, the Proving Grounds or something like that. And that kid had to make a decision between collegiate and the Proving Grounds. And his coach was the teacher in the room that kids went to because they just loved him. Right. He wasn't a gamer. He didn't understand the space. His parents didn't understand the space. They reached out to me. I don't understand the League of Legends, you know, uh, space like that. But we all kind of got together. And this kid, you know, was really torn because he had to make a decision between choosing one of these teams that was competitive in the proving grounds or going to a college. And, you know, uh, just to get excited about what you said, AJ, is, is I don't know if the collegiate scene totally gets the trickle down effect of not having clear standards and guidelines that are having on, you know, honestly, kids down to my level, because I have, you know, I have our state championship Rocket League team for Garnet State Esports is made up the top 0.5%, you know, kids in the world, you know, our kids are like grandmaster plus 12 or whatever it is. Uh, they beat our high school team and they beat college. Our middle school team beat colleges when they played them. And it's, it's been a lot. Well, to, to go full circle back to the, the original topic, this is part of the reason. And when I talk about, talk about there's a lot of reasons that colleges might choose to invest resources, spend a lot of money on one game relative to another game is that the publisher is being easier or harder to work with or offering an ecosystem for you to better serve your students. And the real thing of when we're talking about what collegiate students are interested in, collegiate students, uh, college esports athletes are interested in two things, money and a big stage to play on. They get the money and a big stage to play on, they will be right there. And they'll switch games so fast your head will spin for those two things. And so when we're talking about sunsetting games, there's oftentimes there's a lot of student interest in a particular game, but the publisher can make it really difficult to want to continue to support that game for a lot of different reasons and a lot of the way the, the ecosystem can work. And to do some of those things that we would like to do for our students to set up an environment for them so that where you can recruit, you can be successful, and you can count on that you are recruiting a kid and you're still going to want to spend money on that game for four years. It's nice to know that they want they want it to be a collegiate thing for the next four years uh, when you're doing it. And so it, it's it, it's a long way to get around of as colleges, we need to be able to pull some more level or le levers on how some of these things works than, than we currently do. 
I, I just want to chime in here and uh, say, Chris, I think a, uh, I had not really thought about like the trickle down impact. Like I'm selfishly just looking at like my student, do I recruit them for next fall? Um, but I totally think, and I think university yeah. need to own, we need to own that there is a trickle down effect. And if we fail, like it's really the university's failing. So I just want, um, yeah, AJ and I to like make a note of like, look, this is something we need to actually consider because um, it would be a wonderful world if we could have a stable ecosystem with a few games that we could really, really invest into, get some tradition, rivalries. Um, it would suck if we're changing games every two years. It really would, in my opinion. Yeah, and 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 I love to hear you say that. You know, because I'll, I'll use the most extreme example is is you look at Buga when he won the the Fortnite championship. He was 16 years old. You know, so you're talking about one of, if not the best Fortnite players in the world, was 16 years old. Technically, right? If you're following NCAA rules, you can't even really talk to the kid if you're trying to recruit him. And you've kind of left it up in the air for their coaches and his parents. And, you know, uh, uh, one of the organizations um, that, that I talk to quite a bit is COPE, which is, which is the parent organization for pro esports students, basically. And, and that organization came together because there are these kids, because one of, the, one of the wonderful things, like I mentioned earlier, is our middle school team beat our high school state champions, right? Uh, uh, age isn't necessarily a you know, indicator of talent, right? So we have some seriously talented middle school kids. You know, how can I best prepare my kids for these opportunities if I just don't know what's going on? And that's why I was curious, has this ever, you know, been considered from a, from a genre standpoint? Um, you know, and Mark, I don't know if you want to rein me in and change the topic or if you want me to pose my next question, which is, you know, in the same vein that we're going down is understanding you know, how the collegiate space is making their decisions and how they're choosing their games. Because again, that trickle down effect for people like Ashley and myself um, is significant. You know, I oversee a third of the schools in New Jersey and I have a very hard time talking to parents who have talented kids saying, well, how do I get a scholarship? Well, first of all, their hearts are broken when they realize the, the average scholarship is like $3,500. You know, they think there's full rides out there, which is very rare. Um, but then I also have to kind of say, you know, what do I have to do or how do we get recruited, you know, outside of these for profits who are more interested in monetizing our kids, putting on these collegiate showcases, how am I supposed to connect my best kids with Mark Deppie? How am I supposed to connect my best kids with AJ? Where are these kids looking, you know, especially like Ashley mentioned, they're handcuffed by playing in and offering only what Play Versus has. So, you know, to me, as somebody who is trying to, again, elevate kids, this is why I was excited to be on the panel, not just to share, you know, what, what little knowledge I've scraped together. I get to pick your brains because I'm going to go back and I'm going to educate my coaches who are going to educate their kids and their parents, um, because I think these are the conversations, AJ, like you mentioned, like we need to move past this Wild West thing, you know, we need to start to figure out like this is the pathway, this is the roadmap for successful programs, for talented kids to take their skills to the next level. And I would, I would agree with that because I would say two of my main concerns as a high school esports coach is um, a predatory behavior towards mm. children. Um, um, in part of my literature review for my research, a lot of um, for-profit organizations will contact coaches and coaches who don't know any better may think that this is a great opportunity and you've just handed your kid over and the parents over to this corporation they sign some agreement they don't understand and suddenly they're locked into this contract that they can't get out of yes well that's a, <laughs> I can't agree more with what you just said the that's predatory part behavior by these for-profits who are promising college scholarship and getting you in front of East UCI and getting you in front of Utah. It's, it's ridiculous, to be honest, the, the amount of emails that I get. And similar to Ash, you know, what Ashley's talking about, more than half of the coaches in Garden State Esports do not identify as gamers. They have never played a game in their life. Again, they're the teacher in the room that kids went to because they love them. Right. And that teacher said, I will be the body in the room so you can have this esports team, but I know nothing about it. I think 
the absence of self-governance in collegiate esports for us to do anything that there's a few things that you have to be committed to of of one when you self-govern you have to be game agnostic you can't pick winners and losers amongst the games uh, but you also as negotiating with with properties that belong to publishers you have to create the construct that you want in that self-governance and be willing to walk from any game and say we're not getting what we need to from you so your game is not the one being played uh we're going to we're going to take it somewhere else and that's the big leap to make uh with with this thing that that is the big one of of all my kids want to play league of legends or whatever and going well despite that i didn't hear what i wanted to in the publisher so from the publisher and so we can't make it self-sustaining here or do it so we are we are despite you being interested in that we are investing money in this other thing because in the long term we think we can make a better ecosystem with it but i will say this and it, it is it is the overriding concern with collegiate esports the second time and esports directors were a little irrelevant um when our presidents get together and want to say we want to make collegiate esports a self uh, a self-governed thing and say there's 1100 of us colleges or so whatever we want to do it would you like your game to be one of those games or would you like it to be somebody else's game and that is that is going to be the second where it turns and we can probably make it whatever we want to make it and we can make esports decathlons where kids are playing three different games from three different publishers at the same time if we want to be but that's kind of the big leap to do it to kind of really have any way of shaping it into any of those things at all i think i love it i love i love everything you just said well cool we have a few few minutes left um and yeah i i honestly i don't think in, there are experts out there in this topic um I, I should have should have mentioned earlier, like uh, Robert Morris obviously started the first program and they had uh, here's the door, here's the storm. And then that just got canceled by by a developer. And so uh, there aren't a lot of examples of college esports teams being sunset. So uh, there is no subject matter experts, in my opinion, on this. That's why we're all talking. No one. And, I'm here to learn just as much, uh, just as much as anybody. So maybe, maybe as we uh, wrap up before we maybe have a question or two, uh, I know some people have been asking in the chat and I like that and it's kind of a small group, but uh, maybe just some thoughts or perspectives on, um, on things you would like to see as, or considerations you would like your school or colleges or high schools to make as we consider changing games. Uh, I heard AJ mention a long runway. I think that's a great plan. Um, giving people plenty of time. Uh, I don't know if we're talking about keeping a student on scholarship the entire time at, at their university. I, I've seen that happen in athletics, right? Like you cancel a soccer team and everyone's so up in arms, but you're like, cool, they'll get a scholarship the rest of your time here. And that just feels really like a heavy lift for these tiny esports programs right now. So I don't know if we're going there, but I, I think at minimum, uh, a long runway, as much as we can give them at least a year, uh, seems like a good place to start. So that's my, my contribution, but I'd love to hear what other people think um, in terms of what considerations should be made as we look at moving games. And let's go with Ashley next. Okay, um, well, my ability to move any kind of game in my program, unfortunately, is completely out of my hands. Um, despite the fact that I am on the advisory board for GHSA, they're still an organization who will do what they want to do regardless of any input from um, coaches, which is kind of a huge problem when you have an organization who has an esports section, but the head might not be as knowledgeable in esports. Um, so usually, based on my conversations, they would stop offering a title if there was an issue with the developer, if a, a deal fell through or the developer didn't want to continue it, um, if student interest kind of died down. Um, rating game ratings do play a significant part for high schools um and if that were to happen to say one of my popular games like rocket league i would be highly concerned about the mental and emotional welfare of the children who have just devoted all of their time to that um when implementing new games i kind of worry about how easy is it going to be for like a, a poor school or a rural school or a small school to implement those games. Um, most schools do have computers, they're not great, but all of my computers can run League of Legends and Rocket League, but 
we we have the ability to offer FIFA and Madden, but I don't have PS4s. I don't have money for PS4s, so I can't offer those games. Now, kids could bring them, but I don't, I don't encourage that because I don't want to be responsible for their consoles. So when including new games, I kind of think, okay, is what's the ease of including this game? What's it going to cost? Should it cost anything? And how do we get around um, some of the, the technical issues of including console-based games? Got it. Thank you. All right, Chris, what are your thoughts? Additional thoughts. So this kind of works into the other big thing I had wanted to mention. So maybe it'll be a cliffhanger for part two of this. Um, you know, AJ had kind of said that some developers make it difficult to work with them. Other developers make it easier. Uh, while, you know, Ashley and I think are seeing that there are certain games that we could play at the middle school and high school level that are very popular. I'm curious and hopeful, and this is where I have landed, you know, as the, the president of Garden State Esports, can we explore different game modes or formats in esports and build programs around that, right? So for instance, Rocket League is traditionally three versus, uh, three, versus three. Can we get a 2v2 or a 4v4 season or league to be as respected? Additionally, right, diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that everybody is striving for in their programs. Can we have a mixed Rocket League uh, uh, tournament or season where the teams need to be comprised of, you know, at least one uh, man, one woman, or, or identifying, you know, student? Um, and, and I want to explore those. And so the gaps left by some of our least popular games, I'm not replacing with other games that aren't very popular. I'm replacing them with different game modes. You know, um, I've seen some uh, some leagues are messing around with this this idea of you know a Sadie Hawkins tournament where it has to be again one girl, one guy, or identifying. I don't love the name, but I, I kind of love the idea. And one of the partners we have at Garden State Esports is the Any Key uh, organization, who is fantastic. And you know, I've tapped into a lot of. Uh, diverse perspectives. And I kind of have said, you know, how do we feel about an all girls league? How do we feel about a mixed league? What are the benefits, the pros, the cons? How do I do it correctly? Um, and one of the things that I'm going to launch in the spring uh, is going to be a mixed rocket league. And I'm hoping that brings out, you know, more diversity to the space, but I'm hoping that those developers who are doing the right thing, those developers that are supporting the scene, um, can we mess around with game modes? Can we mess around with formats? And, and maybe that's where the pressure comes when those developers uh, you know, don't uh, fulfill what we want them to do for you know, what's best for our students. So I'm, I'm curious about that, game modes and formats. Okay. Well, cool. AJ, we have about 30 seconds left. Close us out here. What would you like to see as we all try to move on from other titles so the biggest thing is we invest in titles is uh, is our student community it very interested in those things and that's the biggest criteria that we, that we wanted to explore but secondly as we invest money in, and write checks for games it has to be not only is a publisher interested in fostering it as a collegiate championship collegiate esport now but we got to start knowing what their plans are one two three four five years down the road with it as well and we definitely want to work with the people that uh want to see their game be a collegiate championship esport and if not we got to start figuring out who else is out there that does okay well everybody i really appreciate your time this is an interesting topic uh, i haven't really seen anybody talking about it so let this be the beginning of hopefully a robust discussion out in our kind of ecosystem um, and i really appreciate everybody because i definitely feel like i learned how much collegiate impacts things below us so i should mm -hmm. have seen that obviously um, but uh, that's interesting to know and an extra burden I will feel as we try to make these decisions. So uh, I wanna thank you all. Uh, next up, there's a DEI conversation happening in Discord. I welcome everyone to hop into that. At six o'clock, we have our Valorant Invitational. Sadly, UCI is already knocked out of it, uh, but we'll see who, who wins that and takes home the prize today. So thank you all very much and have a great rest of your week. Bye everybody. Bye, thank you.